This video concerns conducting hand calculations for paired t-test. The data that we're going to be using is from a book by Aaron and Aaron called Statistics for Psychology, 3rd edition. This is table 9.7 from that. It looks at the difference for a group of 10 children between their 4-month-old and 3-month-old responsiveness to strangers evaluation. The first thing that we do with this data is we determine the differences between their ten, their four-month score and their three-month score. So we subtract 10.4 from 10.8 and we generate this difference score of 0.4. We subtract 12.6 from 12.1 and we get a difference score of negative 0.5. We do that same calculation for all ten of these kids. That gives us an average difference score of 0.14. After we've calculated the average difference score for these 10 kids, this difference score indicating that on the average children at 4 months old scored 0.14 higher than they did at 3 months old. Once we generate that, we then subtract that mean from each one of the different scores because we're trying to get a sense of how far on the average scores spread out around this mean difference. So we subtract 0.14 from 0.4 and we get a deviation of 0.26. We subtract 0.14 from negative 0.5 and we get a deviation of negative 0.64. These deviation scores are the same types of deviations that we calculated when we were looking at traditional variance and standard deviation calculations. Once we have generated all of these deviations, as with all deviation scores around the mean, they will sum to zero. They're summing to zero because the negative values balance the positive values. To adjust for that, we square all of the deviation scores. So 0.26 squared approximately gives us 0.07. Negative 0.64 squared gives us about 0 0.41. 0 0.76 squared gives us about 0.58. We calculate all of these squared deviations and we sum up these squared deviations. This gives us the sum of the squared deviations, more commonly known as sums of squares, SS. Once we have calculated this sums of squares, we have an option of either dividing it by the sample size, which in this case would be 10, in order to get the variance for the sample. We, however, are more interested in estimating the variance for the population since we are going to be making inference. So in order to calculate the variance for the population, or to estimate the variance for the population, we divide 3.49 by the degrees of freedom, which are 3.49 divided by 9. When we divide 3.49 by 9, we get a population variance estimate of 0.39. We've had to adjust for the degrees of freedom because sample variances systematically underestimate population variances, so we had to use a more conservative or smaller denominator in order to make that adjustment. Once we've calculated the population variance estimate, we then are interested in determining the nature of the sampling distribution. We use the population variance estimate to help with that determination. The first thing that we do is we work on determining the variance of the sampling distribution. We do that by taking the estimate of the population variance that we just calculated, 0.39, and we divide it by the sample size. That gives us a value of 0 0.039 squared units. Okay, so as the squared deviations are all in squared units, the population variance estimate is in squared units, the variance of sampling distribution is also in squared units. To get this value translated so that it's back into the same values that we initially were working with, we take the square root of it. 
So the square root of 0 0.039 is approximately 0 0.2. That 0 0.2 is the standard deviation of the sampling distribution, or more commonly known as the standard error of the sampling distribution. That 0 0.2 tells us that about 68% of the time, scores around the population mean difference of 0 when the null hypothesis is true, that mean difference will be 0. But 68% of the time, the scores just due to random sampling fluctuation alone will be 0.2 above or 0.2 below. So we kind of talk about that 0.2 giving us an idea of how far on the average scores will spread out from the population mean difference of 0 just due to random sampling fluctuation alone. We use that 0.2 as the denominator in our t-test. Okay? Every t-test involves dividing the difference between population parameter estimate and the standard error. So it's always the difference in parameters divided by the standard error of those differences in parameters. So in this case, the observed difference that we had was 0.14. That's the numerator. Our standard error is 0.2. So we divide 0.14 by 0.2 and we get a t calculated of 0.7. That tells us that our observed difference was about 70% of the size of our standard error, or about 70% of what we would expect on the average due to random sampling fluctuation. That's a fairly small t calculated value. It means that we are 7 tenths of a standard error above the mean. Okay, so it's a fairly small distance away from the population mean difference of zero. We're going to, we're going to compare that t calculated to a t critical. The t critical is going to be based on nine degrees of freedom. Since we have 10 subjects, our degrees of freedom will be nine. We're going to use an alpha of 0.05, and we're going to use a one-tail test because we're wanting to see if four-month-old children did better on responsiveness to strangers than three months old do. That T critical for an alpha 0.05 with nine degrees of freedom with a one-tailed test is 1.833. We would reject the null hypothesis of no difference in population means at three and four months if our T calculated value was greater than 1.833. Since our t calculated value is only 0.7, it is less than the t critical value of 1.833, and we do not reject the null hypothesis.